you please pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated. <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> unless you've been living under a rock for the last eight years or so, you've probably noticed that the world seems to have gotten really loud and kind of annoying. Can any of you empathize with me here? Like, am I the only one who's seeing this? Yes. Yes, I know. One media cycle after another, screaming at the top of their lungs about this scandal or that cultural battle bad faith political actors and agitators stirring up tribal emotions on both sides of the aisle, demagogic and ideological journalists and university uh, professors pretending to be pretending at journalistic and academic objectivity, present company excluded. All of this cultural noise is quite a few things. There's lots of things we could say about it. Uh, but I feel confident this morning merely in pointing out its sheer volume. It's everywhere. It's pervasive, and it's really, really loud. But the noise isn't always political or social. Sometimes it's actually really pleasant. BuzzFeed listicles, YouTubers, TikTokers, more podcasts than one human being could listen to in 30 lifetimes, the Facebook doom scroll. Again, more voices to clutter up our souls. And these are only the most obvious suspects that we can think of this morning. We haven't even dipped into the realm of literature, family, employers, the internet blogosphere. I mean, the list could keep on going. And social psychologists have a term for this incessant need uh, for some of these people to be loud and shocking in the public sphere. And they call it the attention economy. Um, if any of you have seen the Netflix documentary, uh, The Social Dilemma, you are probably familiar with the term. And the idea behind this is that companies and advertisers, and particularly social media sites like Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube, are all vying for as much of your attention as possible. And they track this down to the millisecond doing whatever they can to make more and more addictive content so that you simply can't take your eyes off of your screen. Every time you tell yourself one more video, one more post, their algorithms work day and night to outsmart our human psychology, even though we don't think they are, to outsmart our human psychology to make sure that that statement never actually comes true, or at least it takes as long as possible for that to come true. The longer you have your eyes on the screen, the more money they can make. Again, it's an attention economy. They want your eyeballs. And the disturbing thing about this attention economy to me, uh, which is, by the way, doing battle with your family, your civic duties, and your religious commitments, just to name a few things, the disturbing thing about this to me is that what we've observed over time is that the things that uh, people are using to get and to keep our attention are becoming more and more extreme. The internet and television and even certain communities have been saturated with voices and takes that are at best becoming increasingly inane and pointless and trivial, and at worst, utterly tribal, fomenting ideological and even violent ideas. With the proliferation of every new video, every new conspiracy theory, every new ideological cause for us to get behind, our world sinks deeper and deeper into the quicksand of sin and death. So you might be asking, why the buzzkill of an intro on Good Shepherd Sunday, of all Sundays, Deacon Chab? Well, I'll tell you why. In a world proliferated with all kinds of voices and ideas, all vying for our attention, either whether we're conscious of it or we're not conscious of it, they're vying for our attention. The voice of our good shepherd can be drowned out 
in all of the noise. With all of this cultural static in our ears, we strain and we strive to hear his voice calling out to us, to sort it out through the mess of the internet's cacophony of useless but entertaining content. And this move cuts off our life support in the church. It cuts off our ability to hear the voice of Christ calling to us. And if we spend enough time in these distractions, we begin to substitute the truth of the gospel of the kingdom for the easy comfort and simple answers of the world's us versus them mentality, peddled by sloganeering politicians and influencers. In simple terms, if we're not careful, we will become spiritually deaf. And so it's all the more important this morning to hear the voice of our good shepherd gathering us to himself. As we'll see, only the good shepherd can satisfy the longings of our souls. Only he can provide true comfort and true wisdom, all of which these other voices on offer are only counterfeiting. They're only offering a cheap imitation or a shadow of these things. We need to hear Christ's voice because he alone offers the life that the church needs, not only to survive, but to thrive. And so to this end with John, I want to identify this good shepherd clearly in this parable. I want to contrast his voice to our present cultural static, and then I want to explore the life to which our good shepherd calls us. So, how can we identify the good shepherd in John 10 here? Now, this is not directly straightforward. If you were somebody who was just coming to the text and you've only read John chapter 10, uh, 1 through 10, uh, you might not get it right on the surface. Um, I mean, sure, most of us, we've, a lot of us have been in the church long enough, we probably know or have an intuition that, like, oh, yes, Jesus is the good shepherd. Of course, we know this. <clears throat> but if you're paying close attention to the text, as it was wonderfully read by Julianne, uh, this morning, then you probably noticed, or you may have noticed, that Jesus actually hasn't been explicitly identified as the good shepherd in, in this passage. He will be eventually, we just didn't read it. So what is he then? Remember his words in verse 7, uh, as he's trying to offer clarity to verses 1 through 6. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. Well, now that's kind of odd. Maybe, uh, maybe we should call this Good Door Sunday instead. Probably not. Not quite as catchy. Well, throughout this parable, Jesus is both identifying himself as the door to the sheepfold and also as the Good Shepherd simultaneously. So we need to keep that in mind as we're reflecting on the rest of this passage. So in this parable, though, why on earth would Jesus want to be the door of the sheepfold? Uh, well, it kind of depends on how we understand the sheepfold. Um, in, in biblical times, sheepfolds were pens uh, where multiple flocks could be stored safely throughout the night. Uh, there would have been a large area. They would have been enclosed by walls. Uh, and there would have been a, a night watchman who would keep watch over the herds at night. More significantly, uh, for this parable, it's important to know that the sheepfold would have been built with only one single solitary gate or door to enter in. And so this, under, this helps us to understand why Jesus would identify himself with the door this way. See, in his gospel, John is obsessed with expressing the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. Um, later on in John 14, 6, Jesus himself would tell Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so it turns out that this image of this lonely little gate uh, of the sheepfold is actually an image that suits Christ pretty well. Because Jesus is trying to show us that he is the only option for our salvation. He is the only way into the sheepfold. Not Buddha, not Allah, not works of 
not works of righteousness, not sacrifices of bulls or goats. These are options, sure, we can try them, but the Christian faith says no to them as a way of salvation. They cannot be the way to salvation. Jesus claims that role for himself. And as John is trying to show us, he's not at all keen to share that role with anyone or anything else. Because the voice of our shepherd calls to us and says, follow me, follow me. Speaking of uh, the internet, as I did earlier, um, if any of you have spent enough time on the internet, like I have, um, you've probably heard the tortured cliche that, well, you know, all religions are kind of like uh, blind men feeling an elephant. You know, one man, uh, one blind man felt the trunk and thought, well, this is obviously just a really big, thick snake. The next man felt the ear and said, oh, well, this is the tail, uh, or, or this is, a, or felt the, the ear, rather, and likened it to a fan. Another felt the tail and said, oh, this is a rope. And finally, one more said, uh, feeling its side, oh, this has to be a wall. And so it goes with religions, they say. Uh, they say, well, all of, these, all of these people in the parable, they were really just all feeling the same thing. It was an elephant. They just had different experiences of it. Uh, but they were all feeling the same thing. And that's the way it is with religions. Some have experiences of the divine. They call it Buddhism. Some call him Allah. Some call it self-actualization. Others still call him Christ. But these are really all just impulses towards the same God, right? We're all doing the same thing here, aren't we? Well, no, uh, not really, uh, if you think about it. Because what this parable of the elephant misses uh, is that the observer is omniscient. Uh, the observer can see the elephant. <clears throat> so this, this observer would be all-seeing and uh, all-knowing. Well, who is all-seeing and all-knowing among us? I'm not. This is a position that is exclusively uh, exclusively uh, sectioned off to God. Only God is all-knowing and all-seeing. And the irony here is that God himself says, no, there's not an elephant there. These are different things. I am not Allah. I am not Buddha. You will not find your way to salvation by learning who you are and finding yourself or looking inside. And if we pay attention to the, ter to the parable, we hear Jesus saying this. Jesus says that he is the only way to the Father. As Luke uh, would go on to say uh, in Acts, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So we're seeing here that our, our, our good shepherd, who here is identifying himself as a door, a door to the sheeple, he is not just a door. He is not just a way. He is the door. But he is also the good shepherd to whom the door is opened, the one who calls his flock, whose flock knows his voice, who knows his words, and who listens only to him. Jesus is the door. He is the true shepherd, the only shepherd. And although this might feel kind of exclusive or kind of mean, this very fact is what makes him the good shepherd. But moving on. As he mentions in uh, verses 1 and 8 in our text, the good shepherd has rivals, challengers to his authority. In fact, the whole purpose of Jesus telling this parable in the first place is the story which comes immediately before it in John's Gospel. So I want to now contrast the voice of Christ our good shepherd to the other voices which are calling out to us. So if you recall in John 9, Jesus healed a blind man by rubbing uh, mud in his eyes and telling him to wash himself in the pool of Siloam on the Sabbath. Now, the man is healed, of course, but 
The Pharisees, if you remember, simply could not abide this. They could not abide that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. This made him a sinner. He didn't follow the law. And so he was a light to be extinguished. <clears throat> now, this was not the first time that the religious leaders of Israel had led their flock astray. Recall the word of God spoken through the prophet Ezekiel to Israel's bad shepherds in Ezekiel 34. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely my sheep have become a prey, and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd, because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves. They have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. This is a scathing rejection of Israel's leaders. They were bad shepherds, and so God says they will cease to be shepherds. They will no longer feed my flock. And Jesus, I think, correctly identifies what they become. What does he say? He identifies them in our parable. Verse 1, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Verse 8, all who come before me are thieves and robbers. Israel's leaders themselves neglected God, and robbers and thieves they became. They tuned out the voice of God, and soon they no longer heard it, even when that word becomes incarnate and tells them to their face. Friends, we are not immune to the cultural static, to the loudness that drowns out God's voice such that we become deaf and cannot hear it. And so I put this to you this morning, friends, that our culture itself is a bad shepherd. Look at the things that it prizes. Affluence, power, recognition, happiness, pleasure, and not bad things all the time, mind you. These things are good, but only when we give them their appropriate place in our lives. They're fine things to achieve or to get, but friends, they are terrible, terrible shepherds. They are horrendous and monstrous gods if we let them become gods in our lives. When we seek these things as ends, in our lives, they will destroy us. They will eat us for food and not before mobbing us on Twitter. Friends, any other shepherd will abandon us in the wilderness, cold and beaten and ashamed. When we make ends out of these things, they will never satisfy us. They will never challenge us and they will never save us. And when the enemy comes, they will steal whatever they can from us and they will leave us. We need to call out these bad shepherds. We need to stop listening to them. Whatever it costs us, we cannot afford to heed their call any longer. If the good shepherd truly is the light of the world, then he is the life and the light of his people. We must flee from those voices who seek to garner our ultimate allegiance. And finally, this is the glorious truth we recognize in Christ our Good Shepherd. In Christ, we see that God is not going to abandon his flock to these robbers and thieves, to these bad shepherds. Moving uh, to verse 28 and 29, which we didn't read this morning, Jesus assures his disciples that no one will snatch his sheep out of his hand. If you've been brought in through the door into the fold of Christ, then no robber or thief uh, is going to take you 
from him. We may wander, and not may, we will wander, but God is faithful to his promises. He will find us, and he will call us, and he will call to us, and he will not let these robbers destroy his people. Because his sheep hear his voice, and they know that he is the true shepherd. And when they hear his voice, they will run from the voice of a stranger. But friends, the caveat here is that we must be hearing his voice. And this means that we must be where Christ is speaking to us. Um, probably some of you have heard this before, but it's been a common theme that I've been hearing for, for years at this point. That people will avoid church. They will avoid the institution uh, and the people uh, because they want to hold a sort of personal relationship with God themselves. And they'll express that in uh, any number of ways, but I, I hear the usual suspects. Um, you know, I, I experience God most when I'm out in nature, or I experience God most when uh, I'm with my family or with my peers, with good friends. And again, this is not like saying that those things are bad. These are not things we need to avoid. But they're not also not synonymous with the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of Jesus Christ. If we want to hear the voice of Christ, then we need to be where he is speaking. The church is the very body of Christ, where Christ himself has deemed it good for his flock to gather. It is the sheepfold we enter so that we might hear his voice when he calls to us. And where we know that it is him who is calling us. It's not that he, he couldn't, but it's clear that, that Jesus is not seeking to lead us all on our own individual path, our own individual way, so that we can find our own ways by ourselves. Instead, he calls his flock out of the world. That's what the word church means, ecclesia, those who are called out. He calls his church out of the world to be gathered together for, his, for the purpose of his praise and honor and to listen to his voice as he calls to us. So as we gather here this morning, we're gathered into the fold of Christ. And as the cross exits in the recessional, it is Christ himself leading us into the world going before us, preparing the way for green pastures, for our sustenance, for our health, for our life. It's all here. It's all here. But friends, we must be where Christ is speaking. We must be listening for him, even in the midst of these thieves and robbers who try to call us away from Christ. We need to be listening. We need to be where he's speaking. And when he speaks, we will recognize his voice. We will hear him, and we must follow him. So a few points to close here uh, to help us follow our good shepherd. Firstly, uh, I would say don't, don't listen to the static. As I mentioned to start this morning, our culture is loud, and it wants your attention. It's vying for it. It's making money off of your attention. Christ's sheep will recognize his voice. But again, we need to be able to hear it. So a question I want us to be asking ourselves this week, what's causing noise in your life right now that you need to turn off? I know for many, uh, especially during the pandemic, it was cable news. People were obsessed. We were glued to our TV screens, and not only because of the outrage of it, uh, which again is designed to grab our attention, but they were glued to their screens because there wasn't much else to do, it seemed. And they had to cut it off. And friends, I have actually not met a single soul who did this during the pandemic who actually regretted it. <laughs> if you can't hear Christ over the noise, turn it off. Turn it off. Is it cultural expectations? The balance of family and career causing you to neglect weightier matters for the sake of money or honor? Friends, we have to turn the noise off. 
whatever it is, whatever the static in your ears looks like in your life, and it's probably coming from more than one place, you need to turn it off. But second and finally, I want to ask this as well. What would it mean for you to hear Christ's voice more clearly? What would it look like to turn his voice up, so to speak? If I might make a suggestion, and even maybe a counterintuitive one, um, perhaps some of us need to learn how to be silent. There's a, a, a famous quote from Blaise Pascal that seems pretty appropriate here. He said, all men's miseries derive from not being able to sit quiet in a room alone. Uh, that's a way to say it. But I think Pascal is, Pascal's insight here is not just about being quiet and clearing your mind, but it's about slowing your pace, listening. Most of us lend credence to these other voices which are berating us simply because our minds are moving too fast to hear Christ calling to us in any given moment. We're too caught up in trying to satisfy all of these other desires that when the appropriate times come, when the appropriate time comes, we never actually bid them to be quiet. Instead of letting Christ, our good shepherd, protect us from them, the busy mind runs headlong after them. So perhaps the silencing of the mind before Christ is what we need to amplify his voice above our many and varied distractions. Whatever it might be, friends, I would just ask this week, be alert for the loud voices in your life which seek to drown out the voice of Christ, which bid you, come and follow me, come and follow me. It may seem like we have something of a reprieve when we're in here on Sundays, but friends, even here they're calling to us. My phone's not in my pocket, but I bet if it was, it'd probably be buzzing and ringing off the hook. They're calling to us, even on Sundays. Listen, listen, look. Turn it off. Turn it off. Quiet yourselves. That we might hear our good shepherd when he calls. And that we might follow our good shepherd wherever he leads. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.